back inside the No Morning Show. Today we celebrate in love, we discuss in love, and this morning Natasha's going to have a conversation about the basic principles to help keep the love alive. Tash? Welcome back to the Now Morning Show, everybody. Well, it is Valentine's Day, and what better way to start off the show than talking about love and something that many of us have gone through at some point in our lives and something that we need to learn about. It's talking about rekindling those relationships because life happens, yeah? So welcome to the show, Nichelle. Thank you very much. It's wonderful Natasha. to have you this morning. So Nichelle Dawson is with us. Nichelle is an author, a marriage and family therapist as well. So you definitely, I know you, you have that experience. Yes, I do, I do, yes. So Nichelle, tell us something. Keeping love alive. Now, we need to get into, of course, keeping love alive in COVID-19 because I think mm. that probably added a lot more stress. Absolutely. But just in general, what do you think are the basics of keeping love alive in a relationship? Yes, yes. And when you think about, you know, I want to thank you for having me on, on your show this morning. Let me begin by saying good morning to all who are listening. And uh, I think about the basics, foundational stuff mm -hmm. that creates an environment of, of trust, of love, of kindness, of just general um, understanding of each other's needs. And I think that is so fundamental in understanding what keeps a relationship intact. Over, t over time. And uh, one of the things I want to focus on has a lot to do with what we refer to as love languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, love languages actually was coined by, um, the phrase was coined by Gary Chapman, and he has a book by the same name, Five Love Languages. And it speaks to the different ways in which we as individuals, as couples even, um, would uh, interact with each other and appreciate the way that love is given to us. So it is, it, it is based upon how love is received and how we give love. Oh. So for example, one of the, the love languages happens to be, let's say, words of affirmation. Yes. So you have words of affirmation which would uh, mean encouragement, uh, perhaps you would send a nice little text message, or, and, and this is within COVID, eh? we're still dealing with the fact that COVID is a reality. Mm -hmm. So you would encourage someone in such a way that you know, it would bless them, it would make them feel lifted, their spirits feel lifted. And then of course you have uh, what is referred to as acts of service. Okay. Acts of service means that you simply prefer to have kind acts done for you. Mm -hmm. So your love language would mean that you would want somebody to probably bring you breakfast in bed, or you would want um, help with the chores, as opposed to, let's say, um, physical touch which we know is a scarce commodity these days. Of course. So, yeah. but that is also one of the love languages. So you find that the lack thereof creates a bit of an imbalance, it creates a little issue. But very often what you find is that the love language of each of us is very unique to us and is, it really helps us to now understand what your needs are as opposed to what my needs are. And in a relationship, once you get that and you know that I prefer flowers, um, and you prefer chocolates, or you prefer uh, just quality time, which is another love language, mm -hmm. spending quality time with each other. So some people prefer that. So how important is it to <coughs> actually, you know, communicate this, that this is my love language? Because, you know, if we see over time with different relationships, some people will say, well, you know, you should be able to see that this is what, you know, I have to offer, this is what I like. But what about actually effectively saying, this is my love language. Would you say that trumps really just going through the relationship and learning one another? Certainly, certainly. There's no way that we can know this without sharing that information with, the other, with, your, with your partner. So very often people don't even know it for themselves. So there is a way to do that. There is a quiz that you can do. You can find out. It's like, you know, it's an assessment tool, we call it, that allows you to determine and to, to really discover your personal love language. Is it possible for somebody to have more than one love, love language? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, it, it, it could be in a sequence. So for example, you may be stronger in the area of words of affirmation, but it doesn't mean that you don't appreciate a physical touch. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't appreciate acts of kindness, but it just means in terms of your, the sequencing of it, or let's say the, the percentage that you would attribute to words of affirmation may be stronger as opposed to physical touch. Ah. So we spoke, you're speaking <coughs> about physical touch, and I feel like we're getting to a bit of a technical side now when it comes to love. And of course, you know, 
we've always been told and we continue to be, be told right now in COVID-19, you trust the science, you trust the people that do the research. And one of the things that we have learned growing up is you hear this word chemistry. Mm -hmm. It's used in songs, yes. it's used when you meet somebody and it's like, oh, I've got that chemistry, let's yes. go. Yes. But is it real? Is there actually a science behind being attracted to somebody? And does that chemistry actually help the relationship to grow and last? Mm. And, and, and I like where you, you, you're going with this because it means, therefore, that we have to first acknowledge that love has a scientific side of it. Mm -hmm. Remember, first of all, and I always say this, <clears throat> the brain is part of our body, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that we are mind, body, and spirit. So the science, therefore, comes in with the changes that would, 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 would happen in our, in our relationships. For example, if you're attracted to someone, that attraction builds up adrenaline, your heart starts to race, you be, your palms get sweaty, fellas can't even say a proper ha hello to the girl, <laughs> and vice versa. You start to stutter. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's the, the adrenaline that comes along with what is known as dopamine, mm -hmm. which is, a, is a, a, a chemical that is released into the body when attraction takes place. And then you have serotonin, which is another chemical that helps you to f just feel amazing, just feel good. So hence the reason Falling is in love is such an amazing and, and wonderful feeling because you have all these chemicals being released into the body, into the bloodstream, and it's now affecting your emotional out output. Mm. Yes, yes. And in addition to which, let me just show this in of very course. quickly. In addition to which, you have to top it off to you have another hormone that comes into play. And that is a hormone called oxytocin. Mm -hmm. And that hormone creates, the creates in, in, in us as individuals that ability to bond with each other. It's an attachment type hormone. It's actually called the cuddle hormone. And it, it, it allows you to, to bond with someone in, a, in an amazing way. So the, the biochemistry of the brain is very, very important in how we look at, at love. And, and, but it doesn't remain there. You, I like what you said, does it, is it sustainable? Over the long term, what you need to add to that? So you have the attraction that takes place and it lasts for a certain amount of time, yes. Oxytocin and whatnot is happening. But that's not gonna sustain a relationship for 20 years. At least not that alone. Mm. You have to now add other variables into the picture. And those variables would of course involve things like love, like patience and kindness and warmth and generosity and loyalty. So those are other core values that you now add to what is already there, that attraction, that, that feeling of connectivity with the individual. And now you have added to that your values, what you have learned growing up as a child in your own home, um, what you would now be able to share with a partner and even in terms of a long-term relationship. So it's not only the scientific side of it, because as I said before, we are, we are mind, body, and spirit. So it's a combination of all three that would create the wholesome relationship that we want over time. And it's so important because, you know, sometimes you see these relationships that last for years and you wonder, well, yes. how? Yes. And, yes. you know, you, get, you have the honeymoon phase, which you just so accurately defined to us. Like the honeymoon phase is real. This is what you feel. Mm -hmm. Your body is going through this incredible process. But there does come a time eventually, whether it's, you know, <sighs> through work, even possibly some say, you know, they become bored or you even become like brother and sister. There are all mm. these different dynamics that people you know, that come into play that people experience. So what do we now do to overcome these things? I know you mentioned, of course, these traits that yes. we all embody and how we were brought up. Mm -hmm. But what what actions can we take? But before yes. we get to that, before we get to the actions, uh. what are these signs? of trouble, like the first signs of trouble. Yes, yes. And there are so many different signs. I'll be very honest with you. There is no one particular sign that you can, I, you can just pinpoint and say that's the sign. There are many signs. However, what I would like to draw particular attention to where relationships and troubled relationships in particular are concerned is that over the years, researchers have come up and they have actually done the studies eh? and they have found that there are four main criteria, four main behaviors that we as individuals participate in in relationships that can signal that a relationship is in trouble. And 
One of them happens to be criticism. If you find that you're in a relationship and constant criticism, you're always being put down for something, that is a, that's a little red flag that's waving at you. But that's not the only one. As a matter of fact, criticism brings out defensiveness in us. So when we, become defend, when we are criticized, we become defensive. So defensiveness is another one of them. If you find yourself always having to be on the defense and you're waiting for, for the criticism to come, uh, you recognize that that's another red flag that's waving at you. Um, there's something called contempt that really puts one person in a situation of superiority. And they feel as though, well, I can, I can mock you, I can laugh at you, I can jeer at you. That is another red flag. And the fourth one I would want to mention happens to be stonewalling. And stonewalling simply means I've shut down. I am not communicating. I have locked you out mentally. And there is no communication happening. And that is a very, very dangerous place to be in because the highlight of a, of a relationship happens to be your ability to communicate love to one another. And if that's not happening, then of course you know you're, you're, in, hot, you're in some troubled waters. Mm -hmm. Another thing about contempt, let me just add, is that contempt has been known to erode our immune systems. So when you, have, you are in a relationship where somebody's constantly mocking you and jeering at you and putting you down, what happens is that it affects our physical health and uh, as such, of course, our mental health as well. Mm -hmm. So we understand that these are the four main criteria, not that there aren't any others, mm -hmm. but those are the main ones that studies have shown to be uh, responsible, or at least the, the ones that you look out for um, in troubled relationships. So those four main criteria that you just mentioned, for those who are in relationships mm -hmm. and are experiencing maybe one, maybe two or three of yes. those, what would you recommend as their next step? Hmm. Well, I think, again, my, my thing is always, I'm always putting in a plug for this, I'll of tell course. you. <laughs> I always say the brain is part of the body. Let, mm -hmm. us re let us maintain the fact that it's so easy to go to the medical doctor and sit without even batting an eye. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go to a spiritual environment. You go to church, you go to mosque, temple, you're never embarrassed. However, if you have to go to, to see a therapist, yeah. for some reason you park around the corner, you don't want to park in front of the building because you certainly don't want anybody to think that you're, you are going to see a therapist for any reason. And I think we need to start breaking down that stigma and recognizing the importance of therapy and counseling to assist, um, to assist couples as they navigate through turbulent waters. You know? Yeah. And so aside from therapy, aside from therapy, do you have any uh, like tips for them to regulate the relationship mm -hmm. or at least attempt to sort of bring it back? Yes, yes. And uh, the reason I started with therapy mm -hmm. is because therapy sets the groundwork for that yes. in, a, in, a, in a very safe environment, mm -hmm. uh, non-judgmental. You know, you feel that ability to, to connect and to say things in a safe place. And, uh, but that's not all, you're right. You can, in fact, attempt to communicate a little better. You can actually work on it. And I always tell my clients this. If you can be the best version of yourself, mm -hmm. what would that look like? And I actually sit and I wait for you to tell me. So I don't allow you to just go home and think about it. I want to hear you step by step tell me, what does that look like? And re really and truly, what happens in doing that is that you personally, as the client, would recognize, you would hear yourself saying it, and you would recognize that, wait a minute, I can do this. I can really be the best version of myself. And then think about it. If both parties become the best version of themselves, coming together in a union, how amazing that could be. Yes, you will quarrel. Yes, you would have your own little, little disturbances. But guess what? You are able to communicate. You're able to resolve conflict in a healthy way. And in so doing, you are able to now boost your relationship further. You mentioned quarreling, and I know this is something that I will say also with the advent of social media, we've started to become, you know, very analytical of absolutely everything that happens in relationships. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of advice out there. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to quarreling in particular, a bit of quarreling you would say is healthy. <laughs> I mean, what do you 
think? What do you think? I mean, is it healthy? Think about it. You know, healthy communication. Yeah. The communication is yeah. important. It's being able to, you know, express your views. Yes. I mean, I'm not talking about it getting to the point of being violent right. or going on for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But, you know, a bit of back and forth. Would you say that's healthy for a relationship? Or would you say we want a healthy relationship where everybody's like, mm. every single day, I love you. Oh, Everything's no. fine. That is not even practical. It's not impractical. No, it's not practical. It's not practical. No. Okay. And what, what is important is being able to share your views in a respectful manner. Mm -hmm. So even if you disagree, I could disagree with you. That's yeah. fine. I, am, I don't have to agree with everything you, you say and vice versa. And that is healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and what you really want to engender is the ability to communicate how you feel without criticizing the person, yes. without putting them down, without making them feel less than. And, and I say that guardedly because I don't think I can make you feel anything necessarily as opposed to you have to choose to feel what you feel. That's your, your domain. But it is important that you share how you feel respectfully. Yeah. And you communicate in a way, you resolve conflict. You see, conflict is part of life. We, we're not going to get away from that. But what we have to learn to do is to manage conflict and to, to resolve it in ways that are healthy and that is where the problem stems yes you know one of the things that you mentioned again as well I, we started it conflict is a part of life and one thing that's become a part of our life is COVID-19 yes and COVID-19 I'm sure you will agree has definitely taken a toll mm -hmm. on relationships yes. throughout the world yes. so do you have any tips for those who are in relationships and are feeling that. You know, for example, let's say we have a couple that goes to work every single day, mm -hmm. and now we have a couple that for the past three years, they've been working at home together, mm -hmm. and it's brought out perhaps some things that were, you know, swept under the carpet for years, or you learn certain things that you didn't know before, and it starts to affect your thinking. Yes. Do you have any tips or any scientific backing for <laughs> this? <laughs> well, the science is there. The science mm -hmm. is always there. Um, what you would, what I would want to think of is Spending too much time together mm -hmm. is also not a healthy thing. Ah. Spending too much time together. Mm -hmm. You need your space. Everybody, as individuals, we all need our space to be ourselves as individuals. So yes, you love the person, you love being in their company, you, you know, you, you have to work together in the same space. But guess what? Take a time out and go do things on your own sometimes. Just take that moment a week. So if you have to go to... to um, maybe the mall, make sure you're well mas masked up and everything. Or you do something maybe that is separate from your partner. Not, not because you're mad at the person, eh? mm -hmm. but simply because you need some little, some alone time. Yeah. And then you come back. And when you come back, you regroup. And it's a beautiful time together. You see? So we all need to, to, to recognize that love is, isn't about always being up under the other person 24-7. But yeah. it's about allowing people to be themselves, to be free to, 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 to make decisions on their own. And then you come back together and you discuss it and you work together again. And that is, that is an important criteria. Definitely. So I, my final question for you today, because yes. we've been talking about, of course, relationships and with our partners. Mm -hmm. But what about loving ourselves? It's <sighs> Valentine's Day. Everybody's running around, you yes. know, getting a little yes. token of love for <laughs> their significant other, you know. But what mm -hmm. about giving yourself? some love for Valentine's Day. What is the one thing that you think we can give ourselves as individuals on you're, this you're preaching, special? You're preaching to the choir. I am, <laughs> I am telling you, that is, that is my mantra mm -hmm. almost, you know? I say, if you're unable to love yourself, and so very often we find people who are not able to even identify one thing that they love about themselves. And I've experienced that in terms of my clients, in terms of even doing lectures with young people. And you ask the question, so tell me, what do you love about yourself? And they struggle. They look up on the ceiling. They try to find the answer out of the sky. And they struggle to identify what it is that they love about themselves. Yeah. However, if I ask the same person, what do you love about your best friend? Oh my goodness. You get a whole grocery list of all the things that they love about that friend or that particular person that they love. And so it is important that you recognize and be self-aware of you as an individual. Know what you like, know what you don't like, and give yourself some love. Love yourself first. Know yourself well enough and love yourself first. So do things, even if, if you're a single person, you don't have to be um, in a relationship uh, to, to, to do those things. You can, as a single person, 
you can still show love to yourself and recognize that you, you, you deserve that. You are so deserving of love. And you don't have to sit and wait for somebody to give you a flower, which is nice, by the way, but you don't have to. And mm -hmm. if you don't receive one, it's not the end of the world. You still continue to love the person that you are. Wow. You know? Nichelle. Nichelle Dotton, John, everybody, <laughs> fam well, therapist and author as well. You almost brought a tear to my eye. I'll say oh. almost because we're on television. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so true. And thank you so much for being with us on Valentine's Day. Yes, and yes. the way that you ended is so important. We have to love ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And all, yes. all times. All times. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. You're most welcome. Trinidad and Tobago, stay tuned. It's Valentine's Day. It's the Now Morning Show, and we're going to be back after this. Give me sugar when the morning comes. Baby, push it back on me, love.